Hayao Miyazaki is responsible for some of the most iconic films of all time, and if I had to choose one, my personal favorite. Anyone familiar with him will know he's incredibly indecisive when it comes to his retirement, having announced a final film four different times. With the recent release of Hayao Miyazaki's fourth and potentially last final film, I realized I wanted to go back and watch all of the movies he's released where he announced his retirement. It's a remarkably beautiful set of stories, and this may not actually be his last. In 1997, the year I was born, Miyazaki announced his plan to retire following the release of Princess Mononoke before again announcing his retirement following the release of Spirited Away in 2001. Then there was The Wind Rises in 2013, and then finally 10 years later, The Boy and the Heron in 2023. Watching these four films over the last couple of months, two of them for the first time, was an incredibly interesting experience. And I strongly recommend others try it too, because The Boy and the Heron, The Wind Rises, Princess Mononoke, and Spirited Away all feel distinctly unique, while still capturing the essence of what makes Miyazaki so special. And in watching these four films and thinking about how I wanted to craft this video, I found a shocking similarity in the themes of these movies to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, symbols of the end. And unable to pass up the unique parallel, I decided to build this video around that concept. My name is Pei, and today we're talking about Hayao Miyazaki's final film. The Wind Rises is a film where five minutes before I finished it, I still had no clue whether or not I liked it. Then when it ended, I found myself sobbing harder than I have in years. I had never watched The Wind Rises until recently, and some of you might relate to that. I imagine a lot of people who've seen the other films I'll be talking about today maybe haven't seen The Wind Rises, but if you have the patience for a slow burn, I think it's a remarkably interesting film. It's the only story from Miyazaki that has a protagonist that's an actual historical figure. And while that inspiration is only loose and it is a piece of fiction, I do think it's a very grounded film. I think generally speaking, Miyazaki explores the human experience through the fantastic, a pig who's a pilot, a magical cat, or a spirit world. All of these films, despite their fantastical setting, often focus on simple human emotion, driven by characters more than plot. And while The Wind Rises still has an extreme element of the fantastic, it's a very grounded story about an engineer building airplanes. While they do use dream sequences that feel magical, and Foley work that was created by one man in his mouth, The Wind Rises is set in a world with no magic. This story is a fictional take on the life of Jira Horikoshi, the inventor of the Zero Fighter. In The Wind Rises, there are two major plot lines surrounding Jiro's love. The first as an engineer building an airplane, and the second as a person in love with another. The juxtaposition of these two relationships is what I think the film is ultimately about, and what ties this story to the themes of the Four Horsemen. Death as a theme is prominent throughout this entire film, and how could it not be? Jiro invented one of the deadliest planes in World War II, which was also the plane that was used by kamikaze pilots. The film explores the relationship Jiro has in building a war plane, both the guilt and pride that comes with inventing something so beautiful that also had so much potential for harm. On one hand, it's a story about how he as an individual can impact the world around him, but in clear contrast, the second part of this story is about how tuberculosis impacts him and his loved one. Death comes in many shapes and forms. In some ways we can influence it, but mostly it's something that we can't control. It's inevitable, but human beings are tough, withstanding natural disaster, war, and sickness. The wind is rising. We must try to live. While I've only seen The Wind Rises once, I've seen Spirited Away more times than I can keep track. I think that's part of why I latched on to this connection between The Four Horsemen and Miyazaki's final films. Not only did I want something that tied the four movies together, but I also wanted something that would change my perspective, because I've seen Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke many times. So while in the literal sense famine refers to a widespread food scarcity, I choose instead to make it a little bit more broad. Famine for the context of this video essay will be referring to a general emptiness, the lack of sustenance, both literally and spiritually. I think that emptiness as a theme is constant throughout the entire film. For example, No Face's insatiable hunger, or Haku's lack of freedom in not knowing his own name. 
Kumaji's isolation in the boiler room, the emphasis on gold and riches, and how those working at the bathhouse seemed to be there out of a place of self-preservation. Or to start it all off, this scene in the back of a car where Chihiro's holding on to flowers she got for leaving her hometown. A deep-rooted homesickness that will continue to grow throughout the entire film as she's thrown into a literal different world. Spirited Away is very open to interpretation, and the film symbolism being about famine wouldn't be my first instinct. There's a lot of people that interpret Spirited Away as being a story about capitalism, anxiety, and the process of growing up and realizing you live in a flawed world with vices, greed, and gluttony. I think there's good reason that these are the most common interpretations of the story, and I think they work in conjunction with this theme of emptiness beautifully. The solution to each character's emptiness in Spirited Away actually comes in interaction and relationship. Something that Miyazaki does remarkably well is humanize antagonists, creating an environment where audiences can relate to and understand characters that have acted in direct opposition to our protagonist. Chihiro as a character is very forgiving. Multiple times in Spirited Away, Chihiro, directly after being threatened or hurt by someone, offers them the opportunity to walk side by side with her as a friend. What is the solution to a flawed world, one that's sometimes overwhelmed by emptiness and famine? I think Spirited Away argues that it's doing your best within the system, being patient and kind, but also making sure to take care of yourself, finding the connection between you and those around you. For a long time now, when asked what my favorite movie of all time is, I choose Princess Mononoke. If I had to make a case for the best story ever told, based off of the standard of timelessness, approachability, execution, and substance, I would make a case for Princess Mononoke. I know that's a bold claim, but I really do think this story offers something that I rarely get. I'm not arguing it's the best movie ever made, I think many people might not even think it's the best Ghibli film ever made, but I do think there's a substance to this story that is substantial. Whether or not it's the incredible execution in antagonist, making characters that you can understand and relate to but still disagree with, or the ability to acknowledge the nuance in the nature of violence, how sometimes it's a necessity, but there's always consequence and it should be avoided. But ultimately what sold me on this movie most recently is the fact that watching it for the 15th time I still find nuance and depth. There are obvious aspects of the story I missed when I was watching it as I was younger, but also there's subtlety that I'm discovering even now. I look at Princess Mononoke through an incredibly romantic lens. I say that to acknowledge the fact that this is not a perfect movie and that others might not resonate with it in the same way I do, but I do want to make a case for why I think it's so special. Hayao Miyazaki has an incredible attention to detail. I was talking to my brother about this the other day and he felt like the term attention to detail doesn't do it justice, but I think it does. There's a documentary called 10 Years with Hayao Miyazaki, where a filmmaker had an opportunity to be a fly on a wall, a shadow, watching the way Miyazaki makes films. And while I romanticize the films that he makes, I don't want to romanticize the way he makes them. Miyazaki is famously difficult to work with, because he holds himself and the people he works with to an unreasonable, incredibly difficult standard. But this results in films that are filled with tons of small moments that were treated with remarkable care. Like the way the blood smears on San's face when she wipes it, or the light that reflects off of Ashitaka's blade as San holds it up to his neck. Or like the scene where he shoves his hand into the water and everything seems to work. The reflection of the light, the mud moving underneath it, and the way his arm is warped by refraction. And while this is one small example, that's kind of the point. Miyazaki's films are filled with small examples of remarkable attention to detail. But what's really interesting is, to me, I think the plot of Princess Mononoke is more impressive than the animation. Which is crazy, considering how much I love the animation. It's a grandiose, multi-layered story with an ensemble cast of characters that are so freaking likable that the antagonists sometimes feel like heroes. And it's not just the characters that are incredibly well written. Take for example the world building, or the plot that holds up to multiple rewatches and tons of scrutiny. Because despite this movie being over 26 years old, the moral of the story still feels timeless. In Princess Mononoke, there's a deep-rooted theme about the consequence of war that permeates through the entire film. 
that hate begets hate, that revenge is cyclical and there's no winner in the end, because one of the true tragedies of war is the harm that can't be undone. When I was younger watching Princess Mononoke, I saw Ashitaka as this benevolent, non-violent hero who could see the truth and harm of war that others couldn't, someone above the chaos and hatred. But in re-watching Princess Mononoke, I noticed something that was obvious in retrospect, probably what most people know when it comes to Ashitaka's character. He in no way is above hatred. He's as susceptible to it as any other character in the story. However, his circumstance, the curse on his arm, forces him to pay attention to the outcome of violence, the harm that's caused. It must be obvious to others, but for some reason I missed it. Ashitaka is not a pacifist. He's forced to participate in harm multiple times throughout the story. He tries his best not to fight against others, but when given no other opportunity, he absolutely fights back to self-preserve. And every time he does, it brings him one step closer to his own demise feeding to the curse that will inevitably kill him. I've primarily praised Princess Mononoke for its complex antagonists, and while Ashitaka's goals and actions in Princess Mononoke are very simple, he as a protagonist is very complex. Part of what makes Miyazaki's stories so special is the fact that they exist so well in the gray areas of the world. Stories are often black and white with heroes and villains, but life is more complex than that. The people making decisions to fight a war often feel justified, and in many circumstances they are, but there will always be consequence. There will be harm that cannot be undone, but that doesn't mean that sometimes conflict isn't necessary. Princess Mononoke explores this beautifully, and that's why it will always stand near the top of my favorite stories of all time. With the 2023 release of Boy and the Heron, Miyazaki has returned from a 10-year hiatus. As of the time I'm recording this video, there is no digital release for the Boy and the Heron, so I'm going to be scrounging together any footage I can from the trailers, and then using other footage of Ghibli films to fill in the blanks. At first glance, it may not seem obvious why I chose Conquest for the Boy and the Heron. Honestly, to be fair, it might not be obvious what the story of the Boy and the Heron was even really about. Miyazaki thrives in ambiguity, and I think the Boy and the Heron is not an exception to that, it is actually an extreme version of that. If you take a lot of the things I've praised Miyazaki for throughout this video and look at the boy and Heron, it's almost like he took those ideas and cranked it up to 10. This film felt like a love letter to all of the movies he's made before, an exaggeration of the things that make him so him. But I think this movie, compared to others that are a little bit more popular for Miyazaki, will be a bit more jarring for those who aren't familiar with his work. This movie requires you to constantly be filling in the gaps on what's happening and why it's happening. It's incredibly ambiguous and unclear about the progression of the story. Very rarely is an explanation given, which means you can be very creative in your interpretation. But with stuff like this, there's a fine line between nuance and nonsense. But good news, I do believe Miyazaki's new work does fall on the nuanced side of the line. However, whenever there's room for discussion, that's generally speaking not the best sign because it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And I tell you what, a lot of people are going to watch this movie and be like, none of this made sense. I believe that if you were to get a bunch of people to sit down and try to explain why everything happened in the story and how it played into the plot, there'd probably be a lot of debate and headcanon and interpretation. However, if you were to ask those exact same people the emotions that each scene were supposed to evoke, I think there'd be a lot of similar answers. Because while the plot of The Boy and the Heron is complicated and all over the place, the emotional story is actually very apparent, and I really think it worked. The Boy and the Heron is a story that plays with the concept of control a lot. Everything from creating a semblance of stability in an incredibly unstable and unfair life, to characters trying to rule over their environment and bend it to their will. Conquest is to try and take control of that which is not yours. Because I think Boy and the Heron explores the concept of fate in a fascinating way, differentiating between the things that are destined and that which you have control over. Because while human beings have an incredible ability to influence the progression of their life, they don't have the ability to control it. There will always be things that happen that are outside of their control. 
and the desire to conquer fate is a lot like stacking unstable blocks. Inevitably, things will come crumbling down. There's obvious symbolism surrounding conquests in The Boy and the Heron, whether or not it's the creatures that inhabit the magic world or the world itself. And Miyazaki explores these themes through very clever use of the fantastic. But in this case, the fantastic isn't just a different world, it's an Alice in Wonderland-esque, extremely different world. A beautifully animated setting that leaves as many questions as it answers, one that sets the stage for a story of self-discovery through the unknown. It's confusing all over the place, magnificent and just beautiful. Human beings so often run from what is. But The Boy and the Heron is a story about embracing your circumstance, not hiding from it, learning that in letting go of control, you gain influence. And sometimes, that might be just what you need. Miyazaki as a director is singular. The art he makes is unique and identifiable, and it's withstood the trial of time. I don't think there's anyone I could really compare to him, and I think that's part of what makes his movies stand out so much. In a medium where television dominates, Miyazaki works in film. He's created a multitude of different worlds that offer such incredible depth that they feel so much bigger than the stories that they tell. In a medium where Chekhov's gun reigns supreme, he constantly disregards that, time and time again including things that have no purpose in being there besides being there in that moment. It makes his art feel alive, and part of that is because he treats his characters as if they're living people, and the story as if it's real. And in doing that, he creates a setting that doesn't disappear as soon as it leaves the frame. He also explores the human condition expertly, focusing sometimes on simple things like anxiety, fear, and overcoming hardship, but sometimes more complex like the consequence of war, emptiness, trying to control things that you shouldn't, or losing someone close to you. Miyazaki is an expert at capturing a feeling, and each time he comes back from retirement, I find myself both shocked and not very surprised. Miyazaki knows how to do many things at a remarkably impressive level, but retiring doesn't seem to be one of them. <laughs>